As Evan was trying to get the rest of your attention, I told him I'd, I'd get Bonnie's attention, and I whispered in her ear, the sergeants will call on the absent members, which is how we got everybody <laughs> to the floor uh, in the Capitol. And she quickly moved her way up here. That's right. Uh, so so, so we, we, we left Boy. off with Labachi, which really, in terms of civic change in Long Beach, was a, was a huge shift. It was, it, was, it was this change, fundamental change, in how electoral politics happened right. in the city, a change in who it was possible to elect, right, uh, and was really ahead of the curve in terms of where other cities in Southern California were, and some still are, uh, around voting rights questions. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I think, uh, um it, it's interesting to fast forward to see what's happening now. Um, there's, uh, a, the Cambodian community is hopeful now in one particular district to have a Cambodian representative. And it certainly doesn't ensure the ethnicity of um, a, a candidate or a, a council member, but it ensures representation that didn't exist before. And that's true in the school board and the city council. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the language we use in, in voting rights is, is a, having a community being able to elect a candidate of choice. Right. And that candidate of choice doesn't necessarily have to be from the same background as the community, but, but taking away impedi artificial impediments uh, that stood in the way. Right. Um, it, it is interesting, somebody's in historic garb here that's evocative of uh, the suffrage movement. Right. Um, and so when you look at the first charge of the Constitution for us to form a more perfect union, there's this realization that it's, it's aspirational, it's never ending, it's how do we continue perfecting. Right. Um, but at the time that you were working on making elections more fair, Women were still significantly underrepresented at all levels of government. When did you realize that you could be not just an activist, but a candidate yourself? Um, somebody actually came to me and suggested, why don't you run for school board? I had never considered it. I think my close friends and family know that I dropped poli-sci in college. I thought it would. <laughs> I thought it was boring. I also dropped psychology because it w didn't interest me. And what did I become? <laughs> so um, I think that having so many years of being involved in the school district, having my boys go th all through Long Beach Unified, and I was a you know, big believer in public schools for so many reasons, that it seemed reasonable to uh, run for school board because I had that knowledge about the community. So that's how it happened. And then I just learned to campaign and knock on every door. I was bilingual. Um, the majority of that district was uh, Hispanic. And um, having lived in Mexico for a year, it, it, and actually seven years later lived in Spain also, it just felt like the right thing to do. In Spain, during kind of tumultuous times. In Spain, I was there during the very first uh, free and fair election after the dictatorship of Franco. 82? 80, yeah, 81, 82, something like that. 82, 83, whatever. Yeah. So, But, you know, I should um, share something w with you, and that is that after I came back from Spain, there was an editorial in the press telegram. And the editorial said, for all of you folks who are, in, who are civically minded and concerned about your city, there are commissions that you could apply to <coughs> and sit on and get involved in your city. Well, I had no idea what a commission was. I'd never heard of it. I didn't know what it was. But I called the mayor's office. Uh, obviously, n I didn't go online in <laughs> and got the list of commissions and what they did, and I applied to the commission, the Community Development Advisory Commission. 
and uh, because I felt like that uh, had my interests of um, housing, housing and mental health, and uh, support for housing for people that didn't have it. It just all came together in that commission, and that's where I wanted to serve. So interestingly, I knew the council member for my district um, just a little bit. I actually worked in his campaign because I thought he was better than the other guy. And uh, so he knew who I was. He also knew I had worked at the Centro de la Raza and made a very racist <coughs> statement one, one day to me, which was just awful. But he knew who I was, and so I applied to that commission, and I was accepted. And that's really, you know, I told you about the State Guidelines Study Committee. That was the school district. Community Development Advisory Commission taught me just huge amounts about the city, about federal funding, about opportunities for people in the city. And it was my entree into um, city issues city staff, et cetera. And you were involved in housing issues and homelessness issues before you were on the, on the school board. In the 80s, you were involved in these issues. Yes, and so I think part of that came after being involved in the Community Development Advisory Commission. I, uh, literally, I had seen people walking in the alley picking trash. And obviously, that was unacceptable. I didn't understand what that was all about. But I heard about a United Way convening or uh, hosting meetings of the um, homeless something uh, committee, something or other, you know, a group of activists who had come together and would meet at the United Way building on homelessness. So I got involved in, in that. And um, a couple of years later, uh, Evan Browdy, who was on the city council, developed, um, along with the mayor, a mayor's task force on homelessness. So I applied to that. I became the vice chair. And we had one year, just one year, to study the issue. If you can imagine one year. Study the issue. Tom Lawson, you'll appreciate this. One year and to come up with recommendations. But the committee consisted of folks from Cal State Long Beach, a dean from Cal State, um, uh, some social workers, people knowledgeable in the field. And we came up with very substantial recommendations. Um, one of them was to have a Homeless Services Advisory Commission. One of them was to have a uh, staff member, a coordinator for homeless services, to have a mayor's fund for the homeless, to have a multi-service center for the homeless. So many of you in Long Beach know the routine that um, you can make recommendations to the council. They receive and file it. If you don't follow it up and ask and work with one council member and specifically ask for one thing at a time, nothing's going to happen. So I was very engaged, and I was able to get all those things that I just mentioned to you. And then I got involved in the commission as a member, <coughs> a vice chair, and then chair, and so on. So that's still going on today. No, I know you're still on the board of Link Housing. I'm still on the board of Link Housing. You were involved with U.S. Vets. I'm still on the board of U.S. Vets. Yeah. <laughs> So you have a problem letting go. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, so, so in 94, you run for school board. I think that's oh, when that's we so met, funny. was yeah. I think in 94 when you were running for, for yeah, school board. Yeah, I, I do. I want to back up because right in between there came my involvement in the Cambodian community, and some of my friends are, are here today. Um, and that was... Uh, you know, it's been a challenge. It continues to be a challenge for members of the community that lost everything. And, you know, those are memories and nightmares that don't dissolve 
because you live in a different <coughs> society. So that continues to be um, something I'm involved with and part of my life. So, so people Sorry. came to you clearly seeing all of this work in all of these different communities on this broad cross-section of issues. They, how hard was it to convince that? How hard was it for them to convince you to run for city for, 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 for school board first? Was that one the easier decision? You know, it's, school, it's, it's interesting that you asked. School board was hard. That was probably the hardest because when redistricting came about um, in 1991 uh, and we had district elections, part of the reason for that was um, to have representation, some of which would be ethnic representation of you know, various communities. So my predecessor was Jenny Oropesa and there were people who felt that only a Latino could be the representative. And I'll refer you back to my previous comment. Candidate of choice, not necessarily candidate that, I mean, this is really what's the yeah. issue. So I actually went to all my friends, uh, you know, everywhere in the community. I said, how would you feel if I ran? And, um, you know, 99% said, you know us, you know who we are, we've worked together, we've fought together, we've been in the trenches together, you know, you can represent us well. Yeah. Yeah. So then after several years on the school board, you run for the city council. Well, I had been on the school board for, what, seven years at that time? 94 to 2001, right? Yeah, and so, um, the first time I ever thought about the city council was, I saw it in the Long Beach Business Journal. <laughs> you know, uh, Bonnie Lowenthal could run for city council. I mean, it wasn't a plan. I didn't aspire. Uh, remember, I dropped poli sci. I mean, my only interest was really the neighborhood and the community. And um, when people started asking me and I had to think about it, I realized there were so many issues that I couldn't address on the school board, particularly in my district. Uh, overcrowding, um, crime, l lots of issues in the downtown area that I could address as a council member. So I decided to do that. And, and getting back to the housing question we just had, I mean, you, 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 you helped establish the uh, shelters for both homeless men and women. Right. That and was a fight, by the way, to bring in the city's first uh, overnight shelter for uh, homeless men and women. I think the final vote was six to three. Um, it should have been nine zero, but that shelter still exists today in the downtown area. And you led the city's effort to establish a housing trust fund? Yes. <laughs> you want more? Um, it, it's funny because uh, that is supposed to be a vehicle to, to fund affordable housing. Um, and I think the city, I don't know what's happening these days, but during the time I was on the council, while we established it, we never found the, we never got the commitment to put the funding into it. Oh. So you know what, it's there. It's gonna happen if it's not happening already. It's there and that's what's important. So when you were on the city council, you were on the Alameda County, uh, on the Alameda Corridor right. Authority. You were on the MTA Authority. Yeah. Is that when you really started getting more heavily involved in transportation issues or? You know, my transportation experience started from um, uh, a consultant, I became a consultant on a bus restructuring <laughs> contract. Metro contracted with somebody who contracted with me. Um, they were studying different avenues of bus routes in Southeast County. And I was chosen because I was bilingual. And 
I also knew uh, communities of color and different communities that uh, have an interest in transportation. So I just remember standing on the corner of Imperial Highway and some other place, and I did a lot of studies uh, as a consultant, and I just realized how surface transportation impacted people's everyday lives. It, it wasn't anything I ever thought of, but such a big component of quality of life for so many people, and that's how I became involved in transportation. So when I was on the city council, the mayor appointed me to the Gateway Council of Governments, the mm -hmm. 27 Chicago. cities, uh, and over a period of time, because I'd been involved with these 27 cities, they elected me as a member of uh, Metropolitan Transportation Authority. So it built up from there. Do you remember what happened when you appointed me to transportation? I do remember. So the speaker, Mr. Speaker, um, has the responsibility of putting assembly members on various committees and giving assembly members uh, chairmanships and so on. So I thought, because of my background in mental health, that it was a given I was going to chair the health committee in the state assembly. We didn't even have to talk about it. <laughs> Clearly we should have. <laughs> <laughs> so one day, I, uh, after John became speaker, I walked onto the assembly floor and... Uh, can I just pause you right there for sure. a second? Because she said after John became speaker, like if that was an easy thing. Bonnie has told this story a couple of different times. Bonnie was one of three people that basically orchestrated me becoming speaker. So I didn't become speaker, I was... That's true. I, I was put in the speakership by Bonnie and uh, Nancy Skinner, who was Bonnie's roommate in the legislature, and uh, now Congresswoman Julia Brownlee and a couple of other folks, but they were, a, they were the three original ringleaders. So it's important to know the context that I would have never been speaker had it not been for a group of people at the core, Bonnie That's Lowenthal. Right. So that matters when you hear the rest of the story. <laughs> so I walked into the assembly floor one day for a regular you know, session where we vote on bills and this and that. And one of the other assembly members said, um, congratulations on being the chair of the transportation committee. And I said, what? <laughs> what? I couldn't believe it. Marching into the speaker's office, you know, Mr. Speaker, or John, whatever I called you, you know, what happened? I thought I was going to be chair of health. And of course, you were as surprised as I was that I was surprised. And so um, basically, you said, look, I didn't know that you were expecting the health committee, but let's leave it at this. And if, you know, by the end of the year, you're not happy, we can make changes. Well, guess what? A you know. couple of weeks, if not months, at the most later, Bonnie contacted me. She says, you know, I think you had a good idea. <laughs> so it, it was great. Five years chairing the Transportation Committee. It was great. And thank making you, thank huge, you. Thank you, huge thank you. policy shifts yeah, in transportation, you. I mean, which, which really aligns with what you're doing now with, with the harbor, what aligns with what you're doing oh, on no. high-speed rail. Now, what Bonnie didn't say is the first bill she ever introduced on the floor of the legislature was technically a transportation bill. <laughs> it was a bill to allow for alternative Okay, okay, side okay. So this was a, it was a Long Beach bill. You know, I was trying to do some research on what I did for Long Beach. So one of the, if any of you live on the peninsula in, in Long Beach, any of right you? Yeah, Braden. So um, what was happening on the peninsula where people were getting tickets right and left for parking on the wrong side of the street, and parking was so difficult that um, it, it was impossible to turn around and park on the correct side of the street. So they wanted to have uh, parking on either side of the street. 
And um, so there are two stories here. First story is I ran the bill, I wrote the bill that parking should be allowed on either side of the street and in either direction. Thank you, Evan. And um, Schwarzenegger was the governor and it lost. I, it didn't get signed. I, I, I assume it, it passed, but it didn't get signed. Year two, I was chair of the Assembly Transportation Committee. So that meant I oversaw the highway patrol. That's part of the responsibilities of Assembly Transportation. So into my office comes Joe Farrow, who's the head of Highway Patrol. And I said, you know, Joe, I really need to talk to you about a problem in Long Beach. <laughs> <laughs> so sure enough, the next day, Joe Farrow was down here driving the peninsula, um, obviously talking to Long Beach PD, and that was the year we got the bill signed, and people on the peninsula just cheered. So it, it was really great. But when, when I introduced the bill, you know, it's customary on the assembly floor. First bill that, do you, do you want to explain what happened? So, so, so when you, not necessarily the first bill you introduce, but the first bill you present on the floor. So they've already gone through committee, but it's the first bill you present on the floor. All the returning members haze you. And they ask questions to trip you up, to embarrass you, to make fun of you. It is, it is, it is, it is live fire action on the floor of the assembly. And so as a new member who's thoughtful, you want to do something that lends itself to the levity, but that also you can still get past given the hard time you're going to be given. So I presented the bill about the, um, cars being able to park on, on both sides in either direction. So, and so the Republicans, this is a bipartisan hazing, and, and, and Bonnie worked very hard at having bipartisan relationships, and actually at one point she asked me to have staff do a study of what percentage of the bills that we pass on an annual basis pass on a bipartisan vote, and it was in the high 70s. And it was important because everybody always thought about the times that we had fights on partisan grounds and nobody talked about bipartisan cooperation, which Bonnie was really, um, was really instrumental in trying to cultivate good relationships with people regardless of partisan you know, differences. So Republicans joked with her and said, so you've got a problem with parking on the right-hand side of the street. Is this some leftist agenda? <laughs> and that was kind of the, the thematic of the of the of the of the day, and if I may, can I do the, the punchline? So Tom Amiano was our colleague from San Francisco. Tom was one of the first openly gay elected officials in California. He was one of the first four openly gay teachers in California when there was a proposal to criminalize gay people teaching. So Tom's an incredibly important historic figure. And as a freshman, you're not supposed to be involved in the hazing of other freshmen. So Tom technically complied with the, 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 the rules. He didn't ask her a question. He just raised his microphone and said, I would like to support Assemblymember Lowenthal's bill. I'm from San Francisco. We support going both ways. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's a good memory. <laughs> but, 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 but transportation really I mean, has been a significant part of your work now for the last couple of decades. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I feel very fortunate that the mayor appointed me to the Harbor Commission. Uh, look outside the windows here, and you see that this is uh, the primary uh, industry in not only Long Beach and Southern California. One in five people in Long Beach are involved in some way in the um, workings of the port. So I, I love being a part of it. In the legislature, I authored a bill on developing a freight plan for California and an advisory committee which is continuing to refine uh, this freight plan. And we'll meet, you know, ad infinitum. Well, but, but also, even on the city council, you really started advancing the idea of cold ironing before right. anybody else was talking about it. Right. I mean, so, 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 so when you look at ports, 
And here you've got Long Beach and LA, really more goods coming through than, than anywhere else uh, imaginable. And the majority of goods in the country are coming through these two ports. But there's a lot of pollution associated with much of what happens in the port. And so the idea of cold ironing is once the ships come in, you switch uh, to electrification instead of burning other fuels that add to, 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 to pollution. And so Bonnie is a city council member long before she was on the, in the legislature, long before she had a uh, jurisdiction, per se, for, 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 right. for, for, for the port or for transportation, was leading the conversation about how do you maintain an industry that's essential, but do it in a way that's healthier for the environment and healthier for communities. And really, before most ports were looking in that direction, you were leading Thank the way. Thank you. Yeah, and it's still important, and we're still doing it. Um, and we still have an obligation to be as clean an industry as we can possibly be. So um, in the interest of time, I'm going to jump us to 2008. You run for the assembly. We get elected together. Uh, we inherited a $60 billion deficit. Oh, my God. Uh, what's your shortcut take on, on, on your time in Sacramento? Well, in the beginning, first of all, I do want to say, because it's really important, um, all of my work on the city council and assembly couldn't have been done without uh, a staff that was by my side. We worked as a team throughout city council and assembly. Otherwise, none of these things would have been accomplished. So that really, it's about teamwork. So when I joined the assembly, um, I think our first vote, you know, we were sworn in the beginning of December, and before the month was out, we were voting to cut $40 billion from the assembly. I had no idea what the state budget was. I had no idea what I was doing, uh, other than the fact that we were in deep trouble as, as a state, not to mention as a nation. and. Um, it, everything that I always fought for and believed in was cut and axed. Uh, it was a terrible time. So uh, we, we survived because we had to do it. And uh, fortunately, there was the impetus to, to come back after a few years. And we had a wonderful governor, Governor Brown. You all know that uh, in our last year or two, we created a, a rainy day fund. Um, John's wisdom allowed us to create a middle class scholarship. Um, so we were fortunate enough to be there, not just for the downturn and an obligation of cutting things that we cared about, but for the upswing to see that we were coming back stronger than before. If I may just. Uh you know, so we get elected, $60 billion deficit out of a $120 billion budget, making these cuts, but the alternative was for the state to be insolvent. And it was a real possibility three times our first year in office. In the first two months, we had three overnight sessions that were over 24 hours long, including your birthday. Didn't we spend one of your birthdays uh, overnight session? Probably. Yeah, your first, your first birthday of, in the legislature in February. We when we had an overnight session, we had to sleep in the member's lounge. We couldn't go back to our offices. We couldn't leave. And this same friend of ours, Tom Amiano, said he hadn't slept with so many people since high school. <laughs> <laughs> All 80 of us. <laughs> it, was, it was really tough times. So I was really grateful to have transportation uh, as um, an opportunity to uh, work on the economy. And as you may remember, I did one of my first bills was, whatever it was, 2098, was to um, uh, get a bill passed that extended the toll lanes on the 91 freeway from Orange County into Riverside County. It had been held up for very bad reasons, stupid reasons. And uh, we were able to move that forward. 18,000 jobs. Yeah, right but, there. but you, you, you also created a pathway for public-private partnerships and 18,000 jobs. At the time, 
of the highest rate of unemployment in the state since the That's Great right. Depression, right? So it was, it was the value of the work, it was the value of the partnership, and it was putting 18,000 people to work through that one piece of legislation alone, not to mention all the other legislation she did, at the great depths of the highest rate of unemployment in the, in the history of the Thank state. You. Yeah. yeah. So why don't we uh, include a couple of people in the conversation, take a couple of questions from awesome. the audience, and then we'll do a great. little wrap up.